Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Dirt to Dust podcast presented by Outlaw Offroad. You may notice I am alone today. I do not have uh, my illustrious compatriot, Sir Caleb Forbes, with me. And that is because Mr. Caleb is on an airplane currently. He is headed to Central Tennessee to Outlaw Offroad Nashville. Uh, he's going to be doing some filming there for them for the next few days. And then when he gets back, I will be uh, not on an airplane, uh, but I will not be in this country. <laughs> so we uh, we kind of decided to let me go off on my own. I'm going to go off on a tangent. I get to pick the topic. I get to do this podcast all by my little lonesome lone wolf style. So without further ado, let's get going with just me. When other people see dirt, you see glory. And when you see a vehicle for the first time, your first thought is not how pretty it is, but how much abuse can it take? This is Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off-Road. If it's anything off-road and dirty, we probably like it, and we're probably talking about it. You'll get industry info, tech talk, and interviews with the biggest and best in the industry. Let's do it. This is Dirt to, to Dust. Us. And now your hosts, Doug Langford and Caleb Forbes. All right. So, again, welcome back to Dirt to Dust, presented by Law Alfred. I am your host, Doug Langford. We are here again for another episode, and this week I am... All by my lonesome. So it's just gonna be it's just gonna be you guys and me. We're just gonna have a little conversation. We're just gonna talk about some stuff. And the topic that I chose for today um, is one that I get to talk about really, and I don't have Caleb here to like debate me. So I kind of get to go through this and then like pick my own top three. We've done some top three episodes before. So now I get to talk pick my own top three. And that Caleb, that that, that Caleb, that topic is based on a message that Caleb sent me. Uh, back a few days ago, we, we message back and forth all the time, and we talk about topics, what we're going to do for Mailbag, what we're going to do for the podcast, and I kind of seized on this one. He, get, he actually sent me a list, a list, and they were all good. I was like, dude, these are all good topics. Like, we're covered, like, for the next two months um, on topics on these episodes. They were so good. Some Mailbag topics, some Mailbag questions. So let's let's just jump right into this. With this episode, the topic that I chose to talk about all by my all by my little lonesome is the best daily driver off road vehicle. Best daily driver, very important, very important little delineation there. Off road vehicle. So when we talk about off road daily driver, I, I kind of refer to this as the weekend warrior. This is the vehicle that has the sticker on the passenger side somewhere that says, remember, stupid, you have to drive this one home, right? That's that's that one, the weekend warrior. We're going to drive this to to the doctor's office that you work at or to the shop, the warehouse, the wherever you work at. You got to drive that thing to and from work. You got to pick up the kids. You got to go to soccer practice. You got to go, you know, got to go to the grocery store. Got to hit those those target balls, whatever. But then on the weekend, you want to go out and you want to have a little fun with that. Now, that may be you're you're a camper. You're going out and camping on the side of a you know really nice creek there in the woods somewhere. I like to do that. One of my favorite things to do. Or you may be going out and hitting some trails. Generally, you're not going to hit, you know, when I talk to somebody who's got this kind of vehicle, they're not going out and doing super stupid kind of stuff. They're going out, they're hitting some trails, they're hitting some fire roads, you know, some some green stuff, some blue stuff. Um, I obviously, yes, do know some people who go out and hit blacks and double blacks and then try to drive it home on the weekend. But for the purposes of this podcast, we're going to we're not going to pay attention to those idiots, of which I am a part of that group. Um, so there, there are a lot of vehicles that could qualify in this. And when I think about vehicles, um, without getting into like every vehicle out there, right? Like, okay, Ford makes the Explorer Timberline. We're not putting, we're not talking about that one. Okay. I seriously doubt anybody watching this podcast or listening to this podcast is going to want to argue with me that an Explorer or an Expedition Timberline is going to outperform, you know, a Bronco or a Chevy Colorado when it comes to being a daily driver off roader. I do understand that a lot of vehicles, I mean, Honda now has, what is it? The pilot trail sport or whatever. I do completely understand that a lot of manufacturers now are coming out with kind of sport. You know, Ford's got the Timberline, Honda's got the trail sport. 
Um, there's a ton of stuff in the Toyota line that can go off road if they market to go off road, Subaru, that kind of stuff that I'm not really going to consider. We'll give some honorable mentions here, but the ones that I'm really going to talk about, uh, the Ford Bronco, the Jeep Wrangler, the Jeep Gladiator. Um, I'm going to loop kind of all Subarus together. Sorry, Subaru owners. <laughs> um, cause they kind of, it's just like Subaru has like so many vehicles and like, even sometimes like, okay, which one's the Forester? Which one's the Outback? Which one's the Ascent? Like, I don't even remember. So we're just going to lump all the Subarus together. Uh, the Toyota Tacoma, uh, the new one, we're going to talk about the Gen 4. I'm just going to assume everybody's getting out and getting new stuff now. We are going to talk a little bit about the Forerunner. Uh, the Gen 5 is what we currently are in. We do have a Gen 6 coming. There is some information coming about the Gen 6, so we'll touch on that. Uh, and then the Chevy Colorado slash the GMC Canyon. Um, so there's, there's, you know, what is that, six or seven there that I'll kind of touch on. And then I'm going to pick my top three, uh, number one, number two, and number three. And, and that's how that's how this episode's going to go. So let's jump right into it in the order that I just talked about, or roughly there. there. Ford Bronco. Um, this one's going to be kind of controversial. I really like the Ford Bronco. I bought one. I built one. I owned it. I did kind of daily drive it um, for a while. I, I, I Obviously, I, I have a truck. And I have, I've had Ram, you know, I have a diesel truck that I drive around. Uh, right now it's an F-350 and, you know, that kind of pulls the race trailer that does some things, but I like the truck. So sometimes I'll daily that, but I did have a Bronco for a while. It was a Badlands and I lifted it, put some 37s on it. And, you know, I did some light stuff with it. You know, the good thing about the Bronco and this is any, this, this is any IFS vehicle, man, is it comfortable on the road? It, man, if you're going to, to daily drive this vehicle, and you're going to, you know, take the kids to practices and you're going to do the school drop off line and whatever. It is a really nice vehicle. And the interior is to me, it's, it's a pretty clear winner over another vehicle like a Gladiator or a Wrangler. Um, mine had the Lux package, which is a lot like the new 2024 Wrangler and Gladiator that has kind of the big screen inside. The inside is a little bit more refined. But the thing with the Gladiator and the Wrangler is really all Jeep did was they gave you kind of a new dashboard, um, which was redesigned to allow a bigger head unit, I guess. Um, and, you know, I, I, good thing, bad thing, I don't know. I really don't have enough seat time in a 24 yet to tell you whether that's a good thing or not. Initial impression, I like it. Um, but when you look at the Bronco, it was really the entire interior was just more refined. It felt bigger. It's not that much. It's not like it's a huge vehicle. It's not a bigger vehicle. It just, it felt better. The fit and finish was better. Um, the doors felt more solid when they closed. Um, I liked not having, you know, little things like not having um, the door frame on the upper and, you know, having mirrors mounted to the, you know, the front in front of the A pillar rather than mounted where they come off with the door. It was little things like that to me that made the Bronco more comfortable as a daily driver. Um, then, you know, then say a, then say a Wrangler or a Gladiator. So ends the good. <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of it for off-roading for, for the reasons that pretty much everybody knows they are notorious for having tie rod issues. They are notorious for having, you know, some, some weaker stuff when you actually get in to off-roading. If you're, if your idea is going camping or, you know, in a fire trail, you're probably going to be fine. But when you put bigger tires on these things and you lift them and you actually want to go hit a trail, it's a weakness. You know, it's something that you got to think about. So I definitely give it high marks for the daily driver category. And I would put it right in the middle uh, when it comes to off-road ability, um, simply because while I do like IFS at, at speed for off-road, that is a very, very small percentage of the off-road market. And because of the way that it was designed, it, it you know, little smaller components, tie rod issues, steering, that kind of thing, box issues, that kind of thing. I just don't have as much trust in it um, stock or, or even lightly modified. I just don't have a lot of faith in it to be able to perform off-road for a long period of time and be able to actually take some hits. Now, certainly you can upgrade tie rods. You can certainly upgrade all that stuff that I'm talking about. But man, that stuff's expensive. I mean, you want to talk about complaining about upgrading your Wrangler, try to upgrade the steering components on your Bronco. It is night and day difference. Uh, when you start talking about the money involved to do that. Now, 
we're in 2024. That Those prices are going to come down as we get into the future. This might be a different conversation one or two or three years from now. But as we sit right now in, you know, in 2024, um, you know, they are newer parts to the market. And generally speaking, that makes them more expensive. R&D, we've talked about that 100 times. Like, that's just what it is. So as we sit here right now, high marks for the Bronco for on-road um, refinement. It's not a BMW X5, but when it compared to the other vehicles that we're talking about here, it is it is in the upper it is in the upper echelon. And then I'm going to put it right middle of the pack for off road ability. Um, you can certainly build it to modify it to make it better, but when we're talking about kind of that weekend warrior budget, that's that's where I'm going to leave it. Um, moving on to the Wrangler, uh, really Wrangler and JT. The only difference here, they're on road. Their their ability to be daily driven is the same. And I give them kind of upper middle range. You know, if I gave the Bronco a nine on this scale, I'm going to give the Wrangler and the JT like a seven, seven and a half. Um, solid axle makes a difference. You know, when you're going, when you're going through town, when you're driving through parking lots, when you're going over speed, it just makes a difference. It's not as comfortable and the interior is not as refined. Now, got to give it to the 2024. It is better. Now Jeep's giving you the option for power seats. That was never a thing before. Um, you're not, however, going to get cooled seats. It's just something that's not there. And Jeep has been pretty clear on the reasons for that. When you have ventilated seats, you have holes. When you have holes, that is a method of water intrusion that they just don't want, um, especially when you can buy your Gladiator or your Wrangler and it says, hey, you can forward through X amount of inches. So they've been pretty clear that they don't want to do that for that reason. While that is great for off-road ability, and I don't like getting muddy water in my seats where it's going to start stinking and smelling when it gets hot in the summer, I, I can understand that. It is one of those little things that I can't get. And for all the reasons that I mentioned when I gave Bronco high marks is also a reason I'm kind of going to give Wrangler and Gladiator um, a knock a little bit. When it comes to off-road, it really is going to depend on what you're using the vehicle for. If you're going for Wrangler, it's a shorter wheelbase, better breakover angle. Don't know what that is. Just Google it. We're not going to get into it this episode. Where Gladiator becomes very difficult to off-road because of uh, departure angle. Um, but the rear bumper and breakover ankle, be, breakover angle, not breakover ankle. I've already done that. It was painful. Don't do it. Um, the breakover angle makes it tough to get over certain things, water bars, um, you know, fast up downs, that kind of stuff where the angle is such where you can turtle a gladiator a lot easier than you could turtle, um, really anything else on this list. It is the longest wheelbase of any vehicle on this list. It's not much more than a Colorado Canyon and it's not much more than a four, um, sorry, the Tacoma, but it is a little bit more um, just because of the nature of what it is, that it's a kind of a Jeep truck, which gives it high marks in the ability. If you wanted to turn it into an overlander, if you wanted to put a rooftop tent on it and still use the bed, if you want to put a deck system, drawer system, all of that stuff, storage, all that kind of stuff that gives that uh, very high marks on the gladiator. And of course the gladiator can tow about twice as much as the Wrangler. Um, but the Wrangler is then going to be better kind of in the off-road world. They're both going to be about the same depending on what you want for a daily driver. There's, there's no difference in, in your cockpit where you're sitting, um, how you're going to look at it, how you're going to feel, how you're going to sit in at the seats, the center console, the, 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 the dashboard. It's all the same. It's really everything behind you as the driver or the passenger that's where it kind of gets different. And really in the cab, there's really not much. I mean, shoot, the, the doors are the same. So there's not a lot of difference there um, outside of minor, minor, minor stuff. The difference is exterior. And then, of course, from everything kind of from the um, kind of from the B pillar back is where you start picking up differences. And those obviously amplify as you go as you go further back. So I would give I would certainly give Wrangler higher off road marks than Bronco. Um I would give Gladiator, I'm going to kind of put Gladiator the same as Bronco, only because of breakover angle and departure angle. But then daily driver marks, obviously just a hair below the Bronco, just because of fit and finish and some of the things that I like about the Bronco that I'm not a massive fan of on the Jeep. Not that Jeep is bad in any way, shape, or form. It is what it is. They own their place in the market. And really the changes that they've made have been in a response, I think, to what Ford has done, to what Toyota has done, they're doing that in response, which, you know, say what you will to Jeep. They didn't have competition for a very, very long time. There wasn't there wasn't that drive, unfortunately, to innovate. Um, so I guess we should be lucky that we even got the JL in the first place. And then it was so good. Um, they really weren't being pushed by competition to produce that vehicle. And they did anyway. And then when they released it, 
they came out with the gladiator, but then the Bronco showed up and they're like, okay, we got to do something here. Let's drive innovation. And they did it. So good on Jeep and Stellantis for doing that in the 2024. And I look forward to seeing what they're going to do in future years. Moving on to the Subaru. It's, it's a niche vehicle. Okay. I know that there are some small lifts for that vehicle. I get it. Inch and a half to two inches is the standard. And and you can put a little bit bigger tire on there. But let's be honest, when we're talking about off-road, unless you're doing a very specific type of off-roading, the Subaru is just not going to work. Now, I've seen some great drivers do some stupid things with Subarus, not discounting the Subaru's off-road ability. But it's not there when you start talking about what you're taught, what you're thinking when you do a typical weekend warrior. Um, it's just not there unless you're doing some light camping. You're not going to take and put um a roof or a, a big you know a big rack on a subaru you're going to put there's some roof racks out there you're not going to put a big rooftop tent on it just, there's not cargo capability so light light off-roading absolutely can it be a good daily driver absolutely it's right up there with the bronco most of the subarus are smaller than the bronco you're not going to have as much room it's in general smaller interior wise than even some of them feel bigger um than the wrangler um, but they are generally going to be smaller. They're going to be smaller to the ground. They're going to be, um, they're going to be more car-like because most of them outside of the ascent are cars. They just are. So I'm going to give it pretty decent marks for daily driver. Um, it's a great daily driver. Like that's what most of these Subarus are. 90% of the Subarus you see on the road are never going to see off-road, but they do serve that market that we find ourselves in. Nowadays, that's you know, I want, I want that sportier look. I want the blacked out graphics. I want it to look like it can do this stuff, i.e. the trail sport we talked about, i.e. the Ford Timberline that we're talking about. But the overwhelming vast majority of those people are buying that vehicle for what it looks like it can do and not what it can do. Now, if you're watching this podcast and you're a hardcore Subaru person that goes off-road, I hear you. I do. I hear you. You are in the minuscule minority. I love you. And I'm glad that you take your Subaru and do what that thing was intended to do. But it's very clear that Subaru's marketing has gone more towards aesthetics and safety, which is important. Um, in the last, I don't know, year or two or, or plus, ever since really COVID, it's gone more towards aesthetics and it's gone more towards safety um, than it has gone to trying to compete with a Wrangler or a Bronco or a Toyota or something like that. And that's fine. Kudos to Subaru for knowing their place in the market, owning it and marketing to it. No problems there. Um, moving on then to, uh, Toyota, I think Toyota was next. And again, kind of the same thing with the Bronco or actually really the same thing as the Jeep. You've got the forerunner, which is kind of, it's not the same, but it's in the same vein as the Wrangler. And then you've got the Tacoma, which is kind of in the same vein as the gladiator, um, off road wise. I think the Wrangler is going to top the forerunner by a little bit. I've owned Wranglers. I've owned Forerunners. I like the Forerunner, but you have to do. It takes a lot more work in, say, a Forerunner to put even thirty fives on it. I have known suspension companies who have legit said, "I'm out. Um, I am not doing the Toyota market." And the reason for that being, straight up, I've been told, I am not going to develop a lift kit that is that expensive just to fit thirty fives. And forget about 37s. So um, I've been told that by, by guys who matter. That people in the industry who kind of set the tone for what's going to be available for us as, for me as a, a dealer and installer. And as an end user myself. And for you, the end user out there. And when they say, I'm not going to do it. You know, I kind of perk up and I listen. I'm like, huh, that's interesting. Why? And it makes sense to me. So for off-road ability, I would definitely give, I give good marks to the Forerunner. I've done some cool stuff in a Forerunner with 35s. I've done that. But I put a lot more time, effort, energy, parts, money into that Forerunner to be able to do the same stuff on 35s that I could have done in a Wrangler with a level kit and some big and some bead locks, right? Like, I, I really don't even need bead locks, like some wheel spacers or just different wheels that had better offset and like a two inch spacer kit. And that's all I got to do to throw 35s on it. And on a Wrangler, if I shave the fenders, I can do that same thing and put now put 37s or even 38s on it. So for off-road ability, I'm going to do that because you we have to think about budget, right? Everybody has a budget. I have a budget. You have a budget. Everybody watching this podcast has a budget. So we have to think about that, especially when we're talking about 
it's half day, you know, it's got to be a daily driver and it wants to go off road. So we have to build with both of those things in mind. And generally that daily driven weekend warrior vehicle is not going to be built to the hilt, right? Ooh, built to the hilt. That could be a hashtag, maybe a t-shirt. I like it. Um, um, I'm going to trademark that. You can't have it built to the hilt. Um, so anyway, they're not going to have it built like that. So we've got to keep the budget in mind, right? So they're not going to go out and spend $15,000 generally on a forerunner just to put a decent enough lift on there. That's going to clear. And, and in a lot of cases, fender modifications, bumper modifications, all this stuff just to fit 35s. So I'm going to give, and the same thing with the Tacoma. So I'm going to give the off-road ability to Jeep over Toyota, even though if, if it's minor stuff you're doing, Toyota has its niche for sure. Just like the Gladiator has its niche. I don't like the breakover angle for, for hardcore wheeling. I don't like the, the departure angle, but if I'm going to be an overlander, I love the Gladiator. Same thing with the Tacoma. I've owned a Tacoma. I've owned a forerunner. I've built these vehicles. I've gone out. I've done things in forerunners and Tacomas that weekend warriors are going to do. And even more, I've taken a forerunner built on 35s to Moab and to Ure, Colorado, and to Telluride, and over Imogene, and in a blizzard that I got caught in and nearly rolled it off the side of a mountain. Different story for a different podcast. Um, I did a Tacoma. I did a Tacoma build. I shipped it out west. I took it all throughout Utah for a week and camped in it and you know built it for that and did it and took it on some rock trails while we were doing it with a rooftop tent um, on the back and and did all that stuff. So you know my experience is coming from, hey, I've done this. I've built it. I've, I've seen this. I've, I've experienced this. You know, for what my Toyota did, it was great. My knock on the Toyota Tacoma was I didn't like the interior room. Um, it did what I wanted it to do, and it did it on 33s. But would I take it, you know, off-roading? Mm, no. It, the breakover angle, the, the the overall height, I was hitting rocks and stuff on, this, on the bottom and on my rock rails that I probably wouldn't have done on my Gladiator that really wasn't even lifted that high or my new Wrangler that's only going to be, you know, I think I get three and a half inches. Um, so I was, you know, I would clear that stuff easily on an equally budgeted modification wise to my Wrangler or to my Gladiator than I would have on the Toyota. Um, and up until recently, the interior of the Toyota sucked. <laughs> it was absolutely terrible. You know, Toyota in the early 2000s, they came out with that suspension. It didn't change much for the better part of 20 years. That interior came out in the Gen 3 was 16, I think. Um, I think that was right. That might be a year off on the Tacoma Gen 3. They didn't change it. It, it, it took, got very, very little changes. Um, so I wasn't a fan of that. I wasn't a fan of the interior. It was very pedestrian. Uh, and I just feel like when you go out and buy a new car, post, especially now post-COVID, we have a lot of technology available to us, and that technology just isn't in Toyota and I remember going out to buy a Forerunner many, many years ago, and was told I was like, "Hey, I want the TRD Pro, I want the lockers, I want all this, but I can't have this, this, and this." But it's on the limited, and and they were very clear. And they said, "Look, Toyota just doesn't think that off-roaders, you know, this is a TRD. They think that's going to off-roaders." Um, you couldn't be more wrong, especially in today's market. With you know, everybody wants the looks of that, but they don't want to actually do that, right? So I totally disagree with the premise that Toyota said, "Well, this is going to off-roaders, and off-roaders don't want adaptive cruise control." Yes, I do. <laughs> I absolutely want adaptive cruise control if we're going to daily drive this thing, right? I spend seven, eight miles, eh, maybe more than that, actually, now, like 10 miles a day or something on an interstate uh, going from my house to the office or to the shop. Like, I absolutely want cruise control, right? Like, I've got my audio book on. I've got my radio on. I've got my Octane. I'm a Series XM, whatever. That that adaptive cruise is, is pretty legit. My truck has it. My Wrangler doesn't. And... um you know, it's the one option when I bought my Wrangler. I'm like, crap, I wish I would have gotten that because my wife's car has it. My Super Duty has it. Like all the vehicles that I drive around a lot, uh, they have adaptive cruise and my Wrangler does it. And it's something that I miss. So for Toyota to say, eh, we don't really think you need that. Mm. I got news for you, Toyota. Now, all, all indications are that for the Generation 6 Forerunner, that's changing. Um, I haven't been in enough of the... The Gen 4 Tacomas, I do plan on purchasing one um, for R&D, for some testing, you know, to kind of build one and see. I don't know, but I do know the interiors. I have sat in a few. The interior is way better in 2024, way better. It is it is Bronco level now. It is very, very nice. Kudos to Toyota for doing that. And because of that, I am going to give the Gen 4 Tacoma great daily driver ability. Just sitting in it feels bigger. Um, 
than the Gen 3 felt. The seats are nicer. The cloth is nicer. The leather is nicer or pleather or whatever they got in there now. The the head unit's better. It just feels better. Um, and and knowing that the, the reliability is there from the Toyota and they finally gave us engines that don't suck um, in, the, in the Tacoma for, for fuel economy. I and mean, they're still not the best, but, you know, whatever. So I definitely give them an upgrade there. And I think as we get more parts available for the Tacoma, as we get stuff that's available for the Gen 4 that is has been available for the Gen 3 for years, I think you're going to find the Tacoma. I mean, I think the Tacoma is probably going to overtake the Gladiator, I think, there. I think in some areas of the country it already, it already does, even in Gen 3's form. But I think as more Gen 4's come out, you see more availability. They get the better options. I think... I think it's realistic to expect that the forerunner or the, I'm sorry, the Tacoma is going to reclaim its place as kind of the preferred overland vehicle um, over the gladiator that may not happen. And if it does, or it doesn't, doesn't really matter, but I really like the Tacoma when you put it up next to the Colorado Canyon or, um, or the gladiator specifically, I like it for what it can do off road specifically when it comes to um, the ability to kind of be an overlander. What I don't like is its ability that the Gladiator has to throw big tires on it and go off-roading if you want. You know, you don't like the breakover angle of a Gladiator. You can fix that to an extent. You can go big on a lift. You go big on tires, knock it out of the park, go, you know, go do it. I've seen some nasty built Gladiators go do some cool stuff. You can chop a bed. You can, there's things you can do to a Gladiator, um, but they're expensive. And that's why we're not talking about it here because it's stupid money to do a chopped bed on a Gladiator. There's not a lot of them out there, and for good reason. There's not. There is a ton of gladiators out there on 40s. Like that's a thing. I haven't seen a ton of Tacomas on 40s. <laughs> it's exponentially less, so it's not just not going to be a thing. Um, so on road, especially for the Gen 4 Tacoma. Um, yeah, I noticed. I, I know I didn't talk a lot about the Generation Five Forerunner. Um, it's going away. We all know what that is. It's 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 kind of the poverty spec Bronco right now. Um, sorry, Toyota 4Runner people. I like. I happen to like the 4Runner. I think it's a very reliable and stout vehicle, but it is over and it is overstayed its welcome, guys. It just really has. And Toyota's, in my opinion, this is completely my opinion. Toyota's completely freaking botched the rollout of this vehicle. It's been put off year after year after year. I don't freaking know when it's coming. I, I kind of know what it's going to look like. I kind of. I've seen some drawings of suspension and stuff like that who knows if that's going to freaking change so we're you know if you're a forerunner fan I, you know maybe we'll come back to the forerunner next year I, I don't know um i'll give it honorable mention but for right now it's just old it's outdated the suspension hasn't changed on it in 20 years the interior lags behind literally every single competitor that it has and at this point in 2024 it's kind of a disappointment from what I know that it could be. Tundra was redone years ago. Sequoia was has already been redone. Tacoma has been redone. So when you've got when you've got Tacoma, Tundra, and Sequoia that have already been redone and you can't redo the freaking forerunner, like come on, guys. Um, again, this is my personal opinion. You know, I still like to build them. I still have fun in them. I've owned a TRD Pro. I had a 19 TRD Pro. Um, there's really no difference between a 19 TRD Pro and a 23. There just isn't. They've added some options, but not really. They haven't really just. They really haven't done what I think they should do. So for that reason, I kind of, I kind of dismiss it as a daily driver because they don't. I just don't. It was a great daily driver ten years ago when it came out, but they really haven't changed enough to make it competitive with the likes of the Bronco, with the likes of the twenty twenty four for sure, um, Wrangler and Gladiator, with even a Subaru Ascent for driving it around daily for the options, for what you can do, for the comfort level that they provide, because that's where the market's going. I want to be able to go do some cool stuff on the weekend, but I also want to be able to drive it in total comfort and have that technology to be able to daily drive it. So um, I give the Tacoma good marks for that. Uh, I give the 4Runner bad marks for that. And then off-road, I'd actually put 4Runner a little bit above Tacoma um, just because that's what kind of Toyota built it for. Um, I do believe the Gen 6 4Runner is not going to be um, I think you're going to, they're totally changing the chassis. It's not going to be that kind of trucky SUV that the forerunner has been for years and years and years. I think that's going away from everything that I've heard. So this may be a totally different conversation next year when we talk about forerunner, but for right now, I put forerunner a little bit above Tacoma and off-road ability, uh, but well below Tacoma 
and really every competitor as far as daily drivability from a comfort technology availability standpoint, because to get the options that you want, you've got to go into models that are more difficult to modify, like the limited, like the capstones, whatever, all those, all those other models that Toyota has that are, have the higher options. Um, you're not going to find that in a vehicle that, you know, also has a locker, you know, something like that, or has a bumper that's easy to put a center section in or a winch or modify it or cut any of that kind of stuff. When you look at the limiteds and the other trim level. So that's where I'm at on Toyota. Again, maybe a totally different discussion next year, but as we sit in the early part of 2024, that's where I'm at. And then to finally wrap up the options here is uh, Chevrolet and GMC with the Colorado and the Canyon. Now, the Colorado and the Canyon don't get talked about a lot. And I think that's unfortunate um, because I dig them. I really do. I dig the AT4 um, that that GMC is doing. I dig the ZR2. I dig the Z71. I dig all that stuff that Chevy's doing. I really like the ZR2 line um, from Chevy. And, and I respect what they're doing there. I like it. Um, the shocks on these things are daggone legit, man. Like they are doing it. And I think they're doing it right. Um some of it, I think some of the knock on them is their partnership with AEV to do the Bison and the X edition. Um, AT4X is kind of the AEV edition if you're in the GMC side and the Bison for the ZR2 on the Chevy side. I'm not a fan how deep they've kind of gone in with AEV. It's, I, I think that's a lot of the reason that a lot of other companies haven't dove in on the Colorado um, or the or the Canyon. It's the same vehicle. So when I say Colorado, it's Colorado and Canyon. When I say Canyon, it's Colorado Canyon. I think a lot of aftermarket companies haven't dove in because AEV kind of owns that market. Um, and while AEV is good for what it is, um, you know, I'm not going to be putting AEV on my Jeep or my Gladiator and going out and beating the living crap out of it. It's just not what it's for. It's not that, it's not that company's model. It's not, it's really not their place in the market. By the way, this one's really good. Pink lemonade. This is pretty good. I was on the, I don't know what the other one, the, the, the Arnold Palmer kind of version of this. And then the orange, the orange is delicious. You've probably seen that drink, see me drink that in a couple other podcasts, but the pink lemonade is legit. Um, I got the tea one, the tea lemonade one on the way, let you know how to think about that one next week. Um, but anyway, I digress. So Colorado Canyon, Canyon, Colorado, same thing, but because of that partnership with AEV, I think a lot of aftermarket companies have kind of gone away from really diving in on the R and D side because AEV kind of owns that space and, and they know it and that's kind of what they do and, and cheers to them, you know, Hey, good on you. Um, they do have some cool stuff for it. You will get into some money and labor and that's something to be considered. You know, it's hours and hours and hours to do the fender modification on the Colorado Canyon just to fit 35. So you can do it. It's a kit. You can buy the kit, but it is hours and hours um, to get that done. They have a snorkel kit for it, but again, cool. You can do it, but it's, hours and hours and hours of modification to do it they've got the switch system again <clears throat> a lot of it is priced a little high some of that is probably because of the AEV name some of that is because they kind of have market exclusivity and they can and some of it is because uh, it just is i mean it just you know it is what it is and the market can charge what the market will bear and if people keep buying it at, if they keep buying a hundred dollar part at 199 dollars guess what they're going to keep charging 199 dollars and, and I don't see any end of that um, insight from any company. You're going to charge what you can charge, and you're going to charge what the market can bear. So no knock on them. It just is what it is. So um, I think, but I do think that contributes to why you haven't seen a lot of companies that typically come out with stuff on Toyotas or come out with stuff on Jeeps or come out with stuff on the Bronco. Um, and by extension, the Ranger, sorry, Ranger people, you're just not in this discussion yet until I get enough experience in a Ranger Raptor. Then we can talk. Um but until you get some other companies out there kind of pushing the market and advertising their products, you know, that is kind of a way that we, that we see vehicles um, pushed and it can drive sales at the dealership is by having a plethora of availability for parts from the aftermarket. When you have options, when you have choices, when there's some market competition that drives, you know, that drives doesn't drive pricing down, but definitely drives it more into the competitive zone, which is not really the case right now on uh, Chevrolet and Canyon. As far as the interiors go, I dig the Chevy interior. I do dig the GMC a little bit more. There is a difference on the interiors, uh, just like there is in the Silverado and the Sierra, just like there is in their 2500, 3500 line. There is a difference on the interior, and that interior goes to the GMC. Um, if you If you don't need a big truck, 
I definitely give high marks to the GMC for daily driver ability. It may actually be the best on this list, in my opinion, um, as, as far as a daily driver goes. Um, I think the the Bronco may have it just because if you want to store stuff inside in your back trunk area, the Colorado may have it if you want to put a bed cover on it and do some stuff in the back. Um, but outside of that, I kind of give it to the GMC, and then I'd kind of give a tie to the Bronco and the Chevy. Maybe a slight edge to the Bronco because of the big, the really big screen. But I think overall, I'm going to give it to the GMC just because of the uh, it's GMC. Um, <laughs> I really like the GMC interiors for the comfort, for the refinement, for the materials, um, that kind of stuff. The dash isn't really that much different, but the seats are a little bit better. They're just a little more comfortable. So I give the edge there to the Canyon um, on the daily driver ability. Off road, you know, the Canyon and the G and the Chevy are going to be the same when you talk about uh, the ZR2 or the Z71 to an extent. Uh, versus the AT4 or the AT4X. The AT4 versus the AT4X is just the AV stuff. Um, same thing with the ZR2 or the ZR2 Bison. It's a bumper. It's some other exterior stuff um, that the Bison edition comes with, but it is a lot more money. Um, and in my opinion, it's not eight or $9,000 worth of stuff. I just don't see it. I could be wrong. You may disagree with me. That's totally fine. I don't see it. Uh, when I was shopping for a truck recently, I looked at those was about five minutes away from signing on the dotted line to purchase a 2500 ZR2. Uh, was a, was literally about to wake up the next morning and drive six hours north up to D.C. to go buy this when I decided to make a few phone calls to a few buddies in the industry and say, hey, guys, uh, suspension people say, where are you at on lift kits for these things? Because I know the ZR2 is different. And they were like, we don't. We're six to nine months out. That was literally the only reason I am not driving a ZR2 2500 right now or 3500. I can't remember what it was. Um, because of that. And I ended up two days later buying a F-350 um, because of that, because I could readily go and modify it. Um, and because of me and my position and what I kind of do for a living, you know, obviously I'm not going to drive around on a stock vehicle for, vehicle for too long, certainly not for six to nine months when I'm kind of notorious, I'll admit it, for not really keeping vehicles that long. Um, you know, I generally get out of a truck every, you know, one year on average, probably 12 to 18 months. Um, so it didn't make sense to have that truck for half the time. I'm going to keep it stock. So I got rid of the, I, I got rid of that deal. I didn't do it. Um, ended up buying one that was a Ford and I, within a couple, within a week or two, it was lifted on 37s, you know, amp steps, wheels, tires, airbags, all that good stuff. And was, and was towing the race trailer out to KOH. It was gone. So, and I couldn't have been able to do that with a ZR2. That being said, I love the ZR2. I love the look of the ZR2 outside. I love the inside. I love the interior. Um, you know, I actually, I actually like the look of the GMC and the Chevy better than I like the Ford. It's extremely subjective. And I get that. Um, my Ford is still growing on me. Um, but every time I see a GMC 2500 or 3500 parking lot, I'm like, oh, man, that is sexy. That is a good, good looking truck. Um, and the interior is super, super nice. We've got some guys inside of Outlaw Off-Road that have them. I've seen what they've done to them. I've seen how they built them. They, they've gone kind of different ways with them. But I really, man, I really like those trucks. So. Um, but that ZR2 kind of carries all the way down into the Colorado and the Canyon. And I like both of them for daily driver ability. In fact, again, as I said, I think I might like the GMC the most as far as a daily driver of the vehicles that, that we've talked about. It's really close between the Bronco and the GMC, um, Canyon, really, really close, especially in the, um, the Bronco and like the Badlands Lux edition or Wildlands, whatever has the Lux package on the inside. When, when versus when you have the GMC with their, I think it's the AT4 and the technology package, maybe. Um, when you put those two next to each other, that's close. And for me personally, I give a slight edge to the GMC, but I can also understand giving a slight edge to the Bronco. So that is all the vehicles that I considered when talking about a daily driver off-road vehicle. Now, let's finish this off with ordering those in my top three. In the number three position... Um, I'm actually going to give it, I know I kind of hated on this one a little bit. I'm going to give it to the forerunner. Here's why there's nothing wrong with buying a forerunner to daily drive. Um, it's still going to have a lot of room, a lot more room in it for things that you need when you daily drive for groceries, for gear bags, for hockey, for football, for basketball, if you're taking the kids, whatever. Um, there is some options now to get some of the options that you didn't necessarily have three, four, five years ago, even though I think it's going to be better when it comes to the generation six forerunner, 
But where the forerunner gets me is its off-road ability and its proven track record and the fact that there are tens and tens and tens of thousands of these things off-road. You can put rooftop tents on them. You can you can get 35s on them again, but they do remarkably well for what they do on 33s. Like, again, I'm not thinking a weekend warrior is going out and actually beating the living crap out of their stuff. So I'm looking at 33s to 37s, depending on your platform. And I've seen what this vehicle can do on 33s and 35s. And I like it. I like the room inside. It, it is a comfort thing. Um, so I am going to put that in the number three spot for me simply because of off-road ability that trumps the stuff that didn't make it on the list. The Subaru, um, the GMC Canyon, although a great daily driver, um, you know, I think it, I think it wins there. Um, number two is the Ford Bronco. Uh, the Ford Bronco really has come onto the scene uh, and has impressed a lot of people, including myself. Um, I was more impressed when I bought one and drove it around. Uh, it has good off-road ability out of the box. Not great, again, for the steering stuff, all the stuff that I mentioned before. But it can be upgraded. But again, I don't like how pricey it is currently to upgrade. But I do like the interior, especially when you get up into the Lux. Now, not a huge fan of the mid. And for the ones out there that are like, you know, the base models or the black diamonds with the mid, um, the mid package, and even like the high. But to have that Lux package, have the availability of the, I think it's a 12-inch screen in the middle. Um, with the newer Ford Sync, which I like, to have the availability um, of heated and cooled seats, to have the availability of adaptive cruise control, lane keep assist, all that stuff that makes daily driving better. It has really, really high marks from me on on the ability to be a daily driver comfortably, especially with the IFS. And I also really, really, really like, and especially since it's, you know, it's basically coilover all the way around, right? It's strutted front, back, all four corners. The thing rides amazing. Um, and it's not, terrible to to lift it it's pretty inexpensive to get them lifted and get 35s or 37s on them it's it's right up there with jeep money um in that it's right down there with the jeep money uh it's not it's not terrible to get them up and get them on 37s and because of the way their suspension is set up it's still super comfortable to ride around on 37s i think mine was lifted two inches or two and a half inches on a badlands and no fender trimming <clears throat> and i had 37 mickey thompson ats baja boss ats on it didn't have bead locks on it. I had some regular fuel wheels on it, I think. Uh, may have been race lines. And it was it was awesome. Like, I really, really liked it. Uh, I had some rock slide engineering steps on there, which was a good look. And it also gave me the ability to get up in and out of it uh, easier. I could see doing amp steps if you weren't going to off-road it. My plan was to off-road it, but I got rid of it before that happened. So the Bronco, for me, comes in at number two for that. It gets good marks on off-road. It is upgradable, but I don't like that it's so expensive right now. But it gets really, really high marks. Again, it's tied for first for me for daily driver. Uh, and it's probably second-ish for off-road ability. Um, because you can do a few things to it and it's and it's really, really good. And um, you know, I've seen a lot of those in Ultra Four. And I'm not talking about the three that Ford spent half a million dollars on. I'm talking about guys like John Rance, John Williams, those guys who built off the dealership lot Broncos, Josh Atterbury who've taken off the lot Broncos and built them into race cars like we have with Jeeps. And they really honor the spirit of that 4,600 stock class and they're out there getting it done. So um, you can't ignore that when you talk about off-road ability. Um, I can't give it, give credit to Jeep for being able to do that and not give credit to Ford for also being able to do that. So kudos to them for kind of changing my mind on Broncos uh, off-road ability. And then number one uh, is the Wrangler. And I'm adding the caveat, the 2024 Wrangler because of the new dash, because of the the added um, option of um, the ability to have power seats, those kind of things. So in the 2024, in the Rubicon form, um, like I said for Ford, you know, for for Ford making sure it was like a Bronco Badlands, like I said for GMC making sure it's the AT4. When we talk about that kind of that trim level, then I've got to give it to Jeep in a Rubicon, um, or yeah, yeah, Rub we'll just go Rubicon. Um, I don't, I don't care about extreme Rubicon and all that mess, but just a Rubicon doing that in a 2024, you know, I like the new, I like the new exterior, the grill. I didn't like it at first. I like the new grill. <clears throat> I really like the new interior. I like the, the addition of the power seats. Jeep listened to an extent. I, while I don't like not having cooled seats, I absolutely understand the logic and I understand the reasoning. So I don't knock Jeep for that because it makes sense to me. I get it. It may not make sense to you. Totally respect that. I get it. It makes sense to me. So therefore I'm not going to knock it too much. So, um, because of that, you know, I like the ability in the summer, if I'm going to have a Jeep 
And they do, I can take the doors off. Like, that's freaking cool, man. Like, I can take the top off. And I get you can do that in Bronco, too. Um, but where Bronco loses to me versus the Jeep is off-road ability. And I think the difference in off-road ability out of the box is greater Bronco to Jeep Wrangler than it is on-road drivability for daily driver Bronco over Jeep. So while Bronco, I think, is better than Jeep, I think Jeep is that much better off-road. Um, if you know you tallied points, I think that the difference off-road is greater than the difference on-road, vice versa, you know, one over the other and then the other over the other. Um, so that's why I would give the slight edge to the Wrangler. Completely understand the argument that could be made for the Bronco to be number one on the list. I, like I said, I've owned one. I lifted it. I freaking love that thing. It was great. My only fear was when I put 37s on it, I was concerned about breaking steering stuff. Um, and you know, I get the whole Jeep death wobble thing. I understand that it is, it is easier for me to trust a slightly upgraded steering system on a Wrangler than it is to up trust a slightly upgraded system on a Bronco. Now, again, as more parts become available commercially to the end user, and as those prices drop, this could be a different conversation next year. If I had more faith in the Bronco steering system, I would probably have put Bronco at number one here. I, I I could see myself having done that, but we're not there yet. And when you look at what Jeep did with the interior in 2024, combined with the fact that I just don't trust the Bronco steering yet, that is why the Wrangler is still number one to me. It's it's a proven commodity over decades. Um, the Wrangler didn't go away. It didn't go away and come back. It didn't do what the Bronco did. It came went away and came back. Um, it has been a consistent, it has dominated the market and it has set the market for decades. So until somebody clearly makes something better than that for more than a year or two, then I'm still going to, you know, to me, the Jeep is still the king. It's still on top of the mountain. It still sits on the throne. It's being threatened, <laughs> but it has not been dethroned yet. I'll be very interested to see what happens in the years to come um, because I do see I do see what Ford is doing with the Bronco. I do see what Toyota is going to do with the, uh, with the forerunner and, and I'm interested. So we'll see, we'll see. Uh, but for right now, as we sit here, I am going to give King of the throne, uh, as far as daily driver off-road or the weekend warrior, so to speak, I am going to give that title to the Jeep Wrangler Rubicon, uh, for all the reasons that I've talked about before. Now, totally understand that this could start a conversation. I have no problem with having that conversation. I welcome that. That's why we do these podcasts, right? We want to engage with you, the listeners, you, the fans, and you, the subscribers. We want to do that. So if you have a top three, drop your top three. Um, maybe you can give me reasons why you think I'm wrong. I, hey, that's fine. Uh, we can we can have that conversation. Maybe somebody gives me a a top three that is so good, that is so well thought out, that maybe I bring on a guest host for an episode and we talk about it. I have no problem with that. I would, I think that'd be awesome. Just some random <laughs> listener that we, you know, we put them on the app uh, and we bring them on to talk about their top three and why, like, I would love to do that. So drop your, drop your thoughts, drop your top three in the comments. Absolutely love to hear it. Um, I, 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 I can't wait. I cannot wait. I think that this, this, you know, it opens it up. Maybe throw something in that I didn't even think about. Maybe I totally forgot. Hey man, I'm human. I'm imperfect. You know, I'm not right all the time. Um, just ask my wife. So and I can readily admit that I'm definitely not always right. Uh, I may be right like 51% of the time. And that's really the threshold that I need to meet. So, and I'm happy with that. I'm fine with it. So drop it in the comments. And uh, as always guys, um, that's, that's kind of where I'm going to leave it. So I, but I do want to always wrap up by saying thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening, for following, for subscribing, for taking time out of your day to listen or watch wherever you are, whatever you may be doing, whatever time of the day or night it may be. Thank you guys so much. Um, please do remember if this is your first time here, welcome. Please remember to like, please remember to comment, drop your comments below uh, and subscribe. Leave us those, those, those five-star positive reviews on Apple. We are on Spotify now. We are on Google Play now. As always, we've always been on Apple Podcasts. We've always been on YouTube. Please like, comment, subscribe wherever you are. We've got a link on the main Outlaw Offroad website now, uh, theoutlawoffroad.com. You can click on more, drop down to the podcast, and you can see the three 
most recent episode. So we definitely want to be as convenient as we can for you guys to listen and or watch wherever you are. We want to meet you where you are to be able to get this content because we want to keep doing it for you guys. And and we love doing it. It's, it's kind of a highlight of my week to be able to film these episodes normally with Caleb. But again, we did the lone wolf style on this one. So again, thank you guys so much. That's how we're going to wrap it up for 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 this week. Uh, if you weren't happy with Caleb being gone, sorry. Promise, guys, he'll be back. He will be back for the uh, for the mailbag episode this week, and he will be back for next week's episode when we cover a new topic. What that might be, stay tuned, subscribe, find out. As for that, uh, I am your host, Doug. I'm signing off for this week. Appreciate you guys spending some time with us, and we'll catch you on the next episode of Dirt to Dust. You've been listening to Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off-Road. The premier off-road centers for Jeeps, trucks, and SUVs. Sounds a little bit arrogant, doesn't it? Oh, well. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. Be sure to tell your friends about the show, too. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, to see more and to see what Outlaw Off-Road offers, hit the website at theoutlawoffroad.com. See you next time. Don't follow us. You're not going to make it. Yeah. <laughs>